Hi, uh, my name is Darren Pollock. I've been on faculty here at Eastern since 2001. Uh, just to give you a bit of background about me, I did my uh, all my university in Canada. Um, my area of interest, my passion is insects. So there may be a little bit of a bias towards insects on this tour, but uh, you'll forgive me. And also insects are the most dominant group of animals on the planet. So uh, it makes sense that I like to talk about, the, talk about them a lot. So what I want to do is take you through the collection. Um, Dr. Molly talked about keeping the live stuff live downstairs. My job is to keep the dead stuff dead. And I know that kind of sounds funny, but uh, I'll explain a little bit later. But there are some insect pests that will actually get into these specimens and eat them, even though they're dead. Like the insects, for example, there's beetles that will get on the insect pins, eat the beetle right off the pin, and uh, all, you, all you're left with is a label and some dust, and that's not good. So um, the value of a collection like this it is regional. Uh, there are very few collections for the Llano Estacado in this part of New Mexico. Uh, and let's face it, this is a lot of people think this is drive through country. So people who are out collecting natural history specimens, birds, observing birds or collecting insects or whatever will just drive through Roosevelt County and get to somewhere more scenic. Um, so these collections are really important because they were built by students and faculty that have been in Portales. So probably about 95% of the specimens are local. So if somebody's doing um, uh, like a revision of some plant genus or a group of insects, these are really important specimens for putting dots on the map so people actually know uh, where things are collected. All right, so um, these big green cabinets are the herbarium. Uh, the herbarium has been built up over years. Uh, it doesn't get a lot of work these days, but uh, come on down here and I'll show you what uh, what they look like. So these cabinets have uh, sort of standard size shelves for botanical specimens. Uh, these are called botanical sheets and essentially they are, let me show you this one right here. So they're essentially plant specimens that students have glued with special glue to this archival cardboard or paper and right here you can see the, see the label. It's got the family name, the genus name, our catalog number, uh, when it was collected. So this specimen was collected in 1979. And uh, this is, I pulled this one specifically because it's in the genus Potamogeton, which is an aquatic plant. And with climate change and all sorts of other changes going on, the body of water that actually had this plant back in 1978 might be completely gone. So each of these specimens is like a little historical document. So in 1979, on the 30th of May, um, M. Sublet collected this plant specimen from the Pecos River at Heron Crossing in Eddy County. Uh, there may not be any sort of aquatic habitat in Eddy County at that spot anymore. So these, every one of these specimens is a, is a tiny little time capsule and you can go back in time and you can see what, uh, what was collected. All right, so, so these are all the plant cabinets. Come on down here. These are a few more plant cabinets. Uh, one of the problems that uh, I encountered when I first got here in 2001 is that in the last renovation, uh, somebody in their infinite wisdom put the cabinets right under the lights. So it's really, really hard to see what the heck's going on in here. Uh, and somebody also decided later on to put track lighting. But the problem with the track lighting is the, the globes or the fixtures, you can't open the doors of the cabinets with the fixtures on the tracks. So one of the things we're really hoping to get in the renovation is uh, is better lighting so that when scientists scientists do visit the collection and it'd be kind of nice for the scientists or even students and myself and the researchers able to actually see what we have in here. Um, so these are my favorite cabinets, these sort of crazy beige brownish colored ones. These are the insects and uh, I'm gonna get you past me there. The insect drawers are kind of standard size and so this is an example of an insect drawer. These are called unit trays. They have styrofoam on the bottom. And what, uh, what we do is we put a single species in each of the trays. That blue tag on the bottom is a, is a unique number. We have a database where people can uh, search the information on the labels. Okay. So these are standard insect pins, pin through specimens. These specimens have been dead for a long time. There's one from 1963. Uh, I was uh, a month and a half old when that specimen was collected. Um, and these will last forever, as long as sort of basic care is taken. They're out of UV radiation, out of the light, 
And as I mentioned before, the little dermestid beetles can get into the crack in these drawers if they're not, if the lids aren't fitting well, the, uh, the larvae can get right in and they'll just eat the specimens right off the pins. Let me show you this one. <coughs> this is one of the largest beetles in North America. We happen to have these locally in Portales. And uh, when the county fair is happening, the Roosevelt County Fair, it coincides with the, the uh, activity pattern of these guys. They're called Darobrachis. And the adults live down in the ground and the males will fly around looking for females. So these people will quite often find these and freak out because they're, they're just so darn large. But they're, like I say, they're, um, they're one of the largest insects we have locally. And we just happen to have a few of them pinned in this tray. <coughs> All right, I'm gonna go that way. Uh, the next thing I wanna show you is something near and dear to my heart. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, one of the one of the groups of insects that I work on is robber flies, and robber flies are a group of flies that sort of perch on twigs or perch on the ground, and they will fly out and grab other insects and stick their beak in them, inject some venom, and then suck out the guts. And one of the things that I'm studying, and people really haven't studied that much, is what sort of prey they select. So this drawer it may look like a bunch of butterflies and moths, but if you look closely, you'll see that on the top of the butterflies and moths are a big old fly. Okay, so each of these flies was collected in sort of the, collected red-handed while it was ingesting the guts of one of these butterflies and moths. And what I'm finding in my studies is that these flies are, some of them are very specific, they'll go after like just beetles or go after just ants, but some of them like this genus, this is the genus Afaria, they'll basically try to attack and eat anything that moves. Okay, so I've got, geez, I've got probably 30 drawers of robber flies with prey and it's, since 2014, just sort of local collecting, we've got one of the best collections in the world of uh, robber flies and their prey. And the last insect I want to show you is, every New Mexican should know this one. These big guys up here are, the, this is the genus Pepsis, which is our state insect. And what these guys do is they, the females will track down a big spider, very carefully and delicately lay an egg in the spider after paralyzing it, and then drag the spider away and put it in a burrow. And the larvae of these guys eat the guts of the spider. But what makes it really cool is that the larvae of these guys know which of the organs of the spider to leave alive or leave, leave intact. So the spider actually lives in kind of a coma while the larvae of the pepsis chews away at its, uh, as it, at its guts. So as far as a state insect goes, this one is really cool. It's not, you know, a delicate little butterfly. It's a, it's a real state insect. All right, so these are all all these drawers are full of insects. We probably have several tens of thousands of insects. And when I first got here in 2001, I spent the first two weeks of my time in Portales just going through this collection. It's a gem. Uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, with whom I you know, corresponded after I got here had no idea that Eastern even had a collection. So we're trying to put Eastern's collection on the map, getting these specimens in the hands of researchers who can uh, you know, make the best use of them, but it's my job to make sure that they're still in good good condition, and um, I get loan requests, maybe about a dozen a year from scientists who uh, want to borrow eastern specimens. So, all right, come on through here. Now what we have in these cabinets or these shelves are fishes. Uh, fishes in alcohol in jars. Um, these fish a lot of them are really old. This one was collected in, in uh, 1980, so I guess that's fairly old. Um, there used to be, or there was a book published called The Fishes of New Mexico, and due to the uh, conscientious collecting of uh, some of the faculty members and students in the past, The Fishes of New Mexico was based in large part on the fish collection at Eastern. So we've got small fish, we've got large fish, and again, just uh, as I said before, uh, a lot of water bodies change, ponds will dry up, rivers will change course. So a lot of these specimens may not even be found today where they were in, you know, 1960s and 1970s. <coughs> so more fish. You'll notice as we walk down this, this aisle here that there's a fair amount of space between this cabinet and this shelf. Um, one of the things we want to do in the, in the renovation is perhaps get compactors. And compactors are motorized or hand-driven banks of shells that can move. So, for example, if I wanted to work in this 
aisle, it would be the only one that would be open. All the other rows of shelves would be sort of tightly packed, and that's really um, efficient space, utilization of space. Um, this is evidence of student. We have a lot of students who work in the, in the collection. Uh, they get credit for working in the collection. Uh, they assist in curation. They assist in databasing. Um, a lot of the, some of the students will take data from the specimens and will get new records for the counties, fishes that have never been recorded from Roosevelt County or mammals or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of student activity in the collections these days. There's not a lot of student activity in the building at all these days. But uh, this is quite often a very uh, happen in place, and that's what I really like to see. Down here we have more fish. Uh, we had a guy named Sublette who uh, back in the day worked on coronamid midges, which are an aquatic fly. And uh, I don't know if it was his spare time or just a side interest, but he collected a lot of fishes. So a lot of these fishes and jars are uh, based on sublet specimens. So it, it's invaluable. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is to have these natural history collections. Um, someone might say, well, why don't you just take a picture of the fanciest one and just dump the rest and use the space for something else? I've heard that before, actually. Not from here, but from other institutions. People don't realize that specimens uh, vary, species vary. There's big ones, small ones, brown ones, and blackish ones. So we need to have all of these specimens to uh, get a better idea of what, what we actually have in New Mexico. <coughs> okay. Uh, this is sort of the end of the fish. And here we have the beginning of the uh, reptiles and amphibians. And this jar is full of lizards, each of which has a little toe tag. And the toe tag has the locality, it has the catalog number, and it has the date. These are all Utah Stansburyana. I can't remember what the common name of that is, but um, there's a lot of information just in this one jar. So these are all reptiles. Here we're getting into the turtles. Okay. You saw probably a lot of turtles downstairs in the live exhibit. Uh, here's some uh, a bunch of toads. Toads in a jar. This is Woodhouse Toad, Bufo Woodhouse Eye, which is a fairly common one in Portales. So these, uh, you probably realize what these uh, green wires are for there to keep stuff from sliding off. Uh, and again, what we want to do is put in a compactor so that there's not a lot of wasted space. Um, these are empty. We're, we're going to get new shelves and fill, up, fill these shelves up with specimens. Hopefully, go on this way. Some of you might think of a rattlesnake as being really the best place for a rattlesnake is dead in a jar. Uh, this is a rattlesnake in a jar. We have a fair number of rattlesnakes and we've actually had people um, ask about the data on the rattlesnakes. People want to study rattlesnakes or any reptiles, they can uh, gather the data from these specimens. And each of these jars you can see it has the, uh, has the name of the, of the reptile, it has the locality, it has the county, it has the, uh, the date, and then the collector and who determined what species it was. Okay, so here's one that was collected during a herpetology trip. So that shows you that there's student engagement in procuring these specimens. We teach, there's courses taught in herpetology, courses, ta courses taught in ichthyology, mammalogy, and part of the uh, course requirements in a lot of these is for students to go out and collect specimens. They stuff them or taxidermy them, and a lot of the specimens that you see in here are based on uh, student effort. This is sort of a miscellaneous thing. There's some invertebrates in, in small jars here. Here's some crayfish. Um, so these are waiting to be reshelved at some point when we get more space. <coughs> more snakes, more lizards through here. It's really is kind of a labyrinth of uh, cabinets and stuff. These are all mammals. Let me show you. This is kind of a neat one. These are bats. So what we do, well I don't personally since I'm an entomologist and work on bugs, but the, the mammalogy students will, if they get a bat specimen for example, they will take its skull, they'll stick the tiny little bat skull in a, in a vial, they'll have the data that match up with one of the skins of the bat. Okay, So these are taxidermied or stuffed bats. 
uh, and all the bony bits are preserved in these vials. There's some more bats. Kind of cool. They fly, so that's cool. All right. Let's see. Let's go down here. These are still all mammals. <coughs> Um, I just point out here that that room through there is a prep room, and the room through there is our uh, teaching lab and teaching classroom. So it's really handy when students are doing labs, they can actually take the specimens from these cabinets and just wheel them right into the lab, and the students get first-hand experience on looking at actual specimens. Okay, so these are still mammals. Let me show you one of these cabinets over here. This is one of our mascots. Mountain lion. It's been in New Orleans or something. Here we have what we call the small mammals. And these are Paramiscus, which is a type of mouse. Uh, pretty common, sort of a nocturnal rodent in Portales. So these have all been sort of taxidermied or stuffed by the students. Okay. And again, here's uh, this is from Union County, New Mexico inside crater rim of Rock for, uh, Capulin National Monument, 14th of July, 1976. So this one's been around for a long time. So this little guy will have a skull in one of these containers. And one of the neat things about these small mammals is uh, uh, sometimes we get requests, if someone's doing an archeological dig, they'll find evidence of human habitation and they'll find these tiny little bones that might indicate that people have been eating things and they'll bring their tiny little bones and spend sometimes spend hours trying to match up their little rodent bones with the rodent bones in here. And if they can match them with ours, and ours are identified, then they can get a name on the creature that whose bones they found in the at the site. <coughs> okay, so all of these are mammals, small, large, in between rabbits, uh, deer, etc. Uh, there's another prep room where the students, and this is sort of an area where students will. Uh, will prepare specimens. It's kind of in a state of chaos now, but uh, hopefully that will be relieved soon. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Molly talked about minus 80s, but a lot of uh, work in uh, taxonomy and systematics these days is going molecular and genetic. So we're hoping to up our capacity for minus 80s. So when a specimen is collected, um, samples of this tissue, blood, spleen, liver, kidney, whatever, are preserved in the minus 80. And as long as that freezer stays at minus 80, the DNA and the genetic material that can be extracted from those specimens is, it'll last forever, essentially. So um, this is just a little one. We have a bigger one downstairs. But we're hoping, perhaps, to get a few more of these minus 80s sort of for future, future work in molecular and stuff. OK, um, these are all, these guys are all birds, avian collection. Um, we've got, well, let me show you an example. I'm not sure if you recognize these guys, but these are flickers. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure what type of flicker it is, but it's these are flickers. Northern flicker. These are all northern flickers. So bird specimens, um, they're taxidermy. They kind of an ignominious fate to have a dowel shoved up your parts, but uh, that's uh, essentially how, they, how they're preserved, and you can handle them with the stick, and then you, therefore you don't have to handle the birds themselves. So these are all, some of them are fairly old, 1966. I was three in 1966. So this flicker has been sitting in this drawer for a long time. And they're all in really good condition. Uh, we quite often use uh, these moth crystals. This one's empty at, at the moment, but we use the moth crystals for uh, deterring those beetles that will try to get in and chew up the specimens. You can smell the, the odor coming off those bird specimens. <coughs> Some of these cabinets are still in pretty good shape after 30 years, but we're gonna we're gonna try to get a, a budget for replacing the, the hardware as well. The specimens are invaluable, so we really do have to take care of them, and a lot of the, the care is involving the housing and the storage of the specimens. So, uh, so uh, let me show you one last thing. I haven't told anyone about this yet, but this is, in in my opinion, is the unofficial mascot of the uh, Eastern New Mexico Natural History Museum collection is the two-headed cat. So this is an incomplete twin. Uh, it started twinning, it's from a single egg, monozygotic, and then it 
that produced a single body but uh, but two heads. And I, I don't know how common this is, but sadly, you know, calves that are born with two heads usually don't live very long. <coughs> Some, by a stroke of luck, somebody had told us about this, and this is what the this is what the skull of that calf looks like. Okay, so you've got a single spinal cord and so on, but two skulls, I guess, two brains. Um, just a, kind of a freak of nature. All right. So I think that might be about it. Uh, we've gone from the plants to the insects through the various vertebrates, some small critters, some big critters. They're all important. They're all from a really interesting part of the world, at least I think so. I'm a bit biased. I've been here for 20 years. There's a lot of secrets and a lot of specimens that uh, eastern New Mexico can, can produce. And it's up to me and it's up to my successors to make sure that all these specimens, invaluable that they are, are uh, really well taken care of. Thanks for coming.